Episode 6 Dissident Wednesday, July 15, 2037 Five days before Sam did not want to be there. A thick fog hung below the executive level of Perta HQ, blotting out his view of the city. The top of the pyramid punctured the marine layer, but the gray sky above offered no relief. He saw his reflection in the glass. He was the same color as the fog. Rook stood behind him, talking, but Sam wasn't listening. He would just take one. He was nursing a tumbler of water in one hand. His other hand was in his pocket, clutching a cold, hard little pill. The pills that Sam had stopped taking. The pills he was so happy to be free from. No. He let go of the pill, took his hand out of his pocket, and turned to Rook, tuning back into the conversation. Seventy people caught driving illegally printed cars in the last day. Rook said, Huge increase in illegal solar use and all. We patched the vulnerability. This old backdoor admin panel, with a password left over from, God knows when, hardly anyone knew it was still there. But they used our printers to print new printers without security software. We can't brick those from here. Now people are copying all sorts of stuff. The cat's out the bag. Sam nodded. Rook was looking back at him, waiting for a reply, but Sam didn't feel much like sharing the overwhelming sense of dread he was feeling. Sam saw Rook as a blunt instrument, highly capable when it came to physical force and intimidation. He had made Sam feel better the other day, with his story about the tower block in London, but Rook was not someone Sam enjoyed spending time with. But he was the right tool for this job. Of that, Sam had no doubt. The double doors opened as Jane walked in. Sam felt relieved, pleased to see someone else, even if it was her. She looked tense. She stared daggers at Rook for a second, before turning to Sam. You asked to see me? She said curtly. Jane, thanks for coming. Listen, are you sure these kids were responsible for the hack? He asked. No. That's why I said we should. Sam watched as she caught herself. She cracked a slight, tight smile. I'm not 100% sure, no. Why? What's going on? Sam sat on the corner of the boardroom table, not in love with her tone. The hack has been modified. He said. People are using it to print printers we can't patch that will copy anything illegally, with no way for us to stop them. It doesn't look like the work of kids. Jane looked surprised. What kind of things are they printing? Sam stood and paced back towards the windows. Cars, solar windows, batteries, vitro vats. God knows what else. He said, turning to look at her. Now do you understand why we had to go in the way we did? Sam heard himself. He sounded defensive. He knew the raids had upset her and a lot of people that worked for him. A few had quit. No one important. Nov Devet and the rest of the board were standing by him. But some of his friends had expressed disapproval. Last night, while having dinner at the Bohemian Club, he'd gotten a few funny looks. That bothered him. But Rook was right. Better to show force now and nip this in the bud. Jane was biting her lip. Then she said it anyway. But it didn't help, did it? Sam blinked, shocked at her candor. His silence didn't stop her. It didn't do any good, killing that kid Carlos, or banning Broadside. It just made people angry. And now this hack has spread anyway, and... Sam raised his hands calmly, smiling at Jane. We're not the bad guys here, Jane. My heart breaks for Carlos and his family, wherever they are. But what these hackers did could destroy the company, potentially the entire economy. Our response was appropriate given what was at stake. I know it's not easy, but... Not easy? Sam, it was murdered. Oh, give it a rest, love. Rook cut her off. We don't need a lecture from you on. Why? What do you propose? Jane said, turning and glaring at Rook. Her face was hot. We just send you in to kill everyone who copies something? Rook stepped forward, squaring up to Jane. I'll do what I have to do to protect Prota's interests. He hissed which I should remind you, are your interests, Miss Stratton. They stared each other down. Sam sighed. 
stepping forward, pleading for calm. He had little patience for executives unable to regulate their emotions in his presence, but he needed to defuse this. Guys, please. I need you both on my side. Jane ignored him. I'm not scared of you. She snarled at Rook. So you say. Rook smiled. But your eyes betray you. He leaned right into Jane's face. She winced, covering her mouth. Your breath betrays you. She replied. Rook stepped back, embarrassed. Jane shot Sam a look as she stormed out. Sam turned back to the view and sighed, frustrated as he looked back into the foggy abyss. He reached into his pocket, took out the pill and swallowed it, chasing it with water. Michelle wasn't listening to the speaker. She sat at the 4 p.m. VRAA meeting in the dead mall basement in a ring of chairs with the usual suspects. The room was dingy, resplendent in shades of beige and brown. She often came here before heading to the cranes, but she wasn't working today, or for at least the next week, she told her boss. Her arm was never going to be the same. But neither was anything else. They would come looking for her soon enough. She knew that. The question was, what was she supposed to do now? Michelle looked down at her mangled limb. Under her clothes, she could feel the synthetic tissue holding the throbbing lacerations across her shoulder together. The new layers of synthetic skin were held in place with staples and stitches, swaddled in gauze, peeking out from under her shirt. The color was wrong. It was lighter than her natural skin. She felt like a car with a different colored door. The skin was sunburnt and blistering in one place too. Danusha had said that might happen. The pigment took a minute to come in. The skin felt cold and alien against her real flesh. The sunburn crackled and stung as she shifted in her chair. Danusha had assured her the new arm would come to feel like part of her in time. That it would be much stronger than before. Right now, it felt like she had a dead octopus stuffed with fiberglass stapled to her shoulder. Michelle was mad. Mad at her arm, mad at the marshals, Prota, her brother, at Danusha's backstreet operation. But she knew better than this. Negative thinking wouldn't get her anywhere good. She should be grateful she was still alive. But she wasn't. Michelle breathed out, trying to let go of her resentments. She looked out at the familiar circle of faces in the room as she listened to the speaker. Camila sat opposite, with a new guy who looked shell-shocked and broken, the way all newcomers did. He was thin and pinched, in his late forties, kind of pathetic looking. His skin was swarvy, but sickly white, like he was ill. It seemed like he'd been sleeping outside. Michelle knew what he was going through. She'd felt as bad as he looked when she came in, too. That's all the time we have. The meeting secretary began. The circle stirred as the meeting ended. Michelle got up to leave, not wanting to make small talk. Camila tapped her good shoulder as she headed for the door. Hey. Michelle turned. The new guy was next to Camila. How's your arm, honey? Michelle shrugged her good shoulder, nursing her bad one. Camila nodded. I still can't believe it. I thought all this was behind us. After the massacre in 29. Her voice got small as it trailed off. She caught herself. Anyway, Mitchell, I want you to meet Art. It's his first meeting. Art offered a hand. Michelle shook it with her good one. Art's grip was limp and cold. Art needs a sponsor. I thought maybe you guys should talk. Michelle felt her chest tighten with reservation. Yeah. Michelle said, meaning never in a million years. She feigned regret, shaking her head and motioning to her shoulder. It's just that, right now, what with everything? She stopped talking as a chat message from Camila appeared in the corner of her eye. Right now you need to be of service, mommy. Michelle blinked away the words. Camila was right. The best way for addicts to deal with their problems was to help someone else with theirs. Teresa is in your boat here today. A smiley face. Michelle sighed. She didn't completely buy all Camila's cosmic coincidence stuff, especially when delivered with emojis. But she had stayed sober by listening to her, even when she didn't want to. Uh, yeah, sure. She relented. I guess I can help. Got time for a coffee? Art nodded, thanking her. 
Michelle held out her hand again. Art shook it a little harder this time. Michelle and Art posted up at the small, down-at-heel coffee shop across the street from the dead mall, where VRAA members often gathered. Camila was sat in a booth nearby with a group of old-timers. Michelle had sponsored people in VRAA before. It was pretty straightforward. You helped them define the stuff they wanted to stay away from, going deep in the metaverse or whatever digital addiction they were struggling with. Then you checked in with them and made sure they were sticking to their plan and coached them through the 12 steps. Working the steps was how Michelle got clean. Helping others do the same was how she stayed that way. Michelle listened as Art told his story. It was a sad one, same as everyone else's. He didn't elaborate much. In fact, he avoided details, bursting into tears when he got to certain parts. This didn't phase Michelle. She had been where he was. She understood the rawness of it all, the shame and the guilt he was feeling. All Art would tell her was that something bad happened while he was going deep in a metaverse den downtown. There had been repercussions, and he had to go on the run, leaving his family behind. But there was clearly more to it. Art looked like he'd stared death in the face. It was fine. Michelle didn't need to hear it all right now. She would get through the rest of his story with him in detail as they worked the steps. It was clear Art was broken enough to be serious about getting clean. That was enough for her. The more she listened, the more she forgot her own troubles. She found herself relaxing a little, despite the pain. Camila was right, helping him was helping her. They got up to leave. Michelle knew of an empty storage unit by her place in the towers where Art could crash for a while. This wasn't part of her responsibility as Art's sponsor. But something had gone horribly wrong in this guy's life, and as Michelle listened, she felt compelled to keep him out of harm's way. Maybe this was the sense of purpose she'd been looking for. Art started sobbing again, thanking her profusely. They walked out of the cafe. Camila walked over again as they left, pulling Michelle to one side. Hey, I almost forgot. You should come back over here to the dead mall tomorrow evening. Camila whispered, looking shifty. An old friend of mine is organizing some people. A direct accent group, you might call it. Bring your brother. A lot of broadsiders are coming. A lot of old faces from the protest days too. Folks are angry about what the marshals did to you kids. Camila handed Michelle a small silver square, an NFT tag. On it was a picture of a hand with an eye in the middle. Michelle opened it using Lumen OS. Inside were files containing what looked like armor and weapon designs for broadside games, links to an encrypted torrent, an encrypted chat app called Descent, a strange looking README file, some currency she'd never heard of called Bones, and an NFT book called Rotten to the Core. Is this a VRAA thing? Michelle asked, puzzled. No. Camila replied. This is something else. It was early evening by the time the fog outside had cleared and the boardroom was Sam's once more. The pills had kicked in. It felt like he was sitting with an old friend. It had been too long. His therapist wouldn't be happy, but he needed this today. This hack was spreading, undermining all he had built. So far, it was mostly concentrated in the Bay Area, but Washington and the rest of the country was watching. If Proto didn't contain this, they would lose their grip, and at that point, whether Acra was signed would be moot. Code is law. Sam had been in tech long enough to understand that. He needed to be in control of his emotions to get through this, so pills it was. He leaned back in his chair, looking out at the city like he was waiting for a ship to come in. The sky was a study in orange and blue, underscored by the uneven silhouette of rolling hills, known as Twin Peaks. Downtown San Francisco glowed, the bay glinting behind it. White and red lights flowed through the city's arteries. Behind it all, the Sutro Tower loomed from the hilltops. The tower was still one of the most distinctive parts of the skyline, even though it was built in the 1970s. The imposing steel structure was painted red and white, like a candy cane. Red lights blinked from its head, warning passing aircraft. 
It stood on three tall legs that formed an hourglass-shaped frame. It reached almost 1,000 feet into the air, its three-horned crown of antenna jetting into the sky. Once it was used to transmit FM radio. Now it carried digital signals, delivering channels, streams, and data across the Bay Area. San Franciscans had always been divided over the structure. Some saw a postmodern thing of beauty. Others saw a monster that looked like it might storm down the hill and destroy the Golden Gate Bridge. Sam liked this analogy, but not because he saw a monster. To him, the tower was a god. He had redesigned the marshals with the tower in mind when he took over Prota. Their wiry metal frames painted red and white, their glowing eyes watching the city. Power. Security. Freedom. This is what he offered. This is what his technology ecosystem, his robot army, and this towering steel giant before him stood for. He flipped on the news. Prota advised people to stay vigilant, but carry on as normal despite the security breach. Announced the anchor. Expect more marshals on the streets, longer lines at checkpoints, and heavier air surveillance. Sam looked out at the tower again. He saw what he was waiting for come into view. A huge, hunchbacked hexacopter rose over the tower like a vulture. It was painted the same red and white as the marshals and the tower below it, held in the air by eight huge rotor blades. Its wide, flat body looked like a manta ray. The ship cloaked, vanishing into the sunset. Sam smiled. He could fix this. On the other side of the hills, deep in the streets of South City, a crowd pulsated at a block party. Aside from the bloodshed and violence at the raided broadside games, the hack had brought nothing but happiness this side of town. An old optimism had resurfaced. Music pumped from speaker stacks lining the street. Vitrovats bubbled on food carts, spitting out all manner of sizzling street delicacies. Stalls printed solar panels, vats, and other basics. Hacked broadside weapons and armor, both physical and NFT versions, were being sold everywhere. The air was thick with all kinds of sweet-smelling smoke. 3D bass lines sent tremors underfoot as the crowd moved in unison to a skittering, tribal beat. Riz and Jaden bobbed and weaved through the crowd towards the place Zero had told them to meet. Freshly printed D-tag hoodies shrouded their faces and, more importantly, their data. They darted past the printer stalls and sound systems. Jaden looked up at a newscast streaming on a big screen above, patching the anchor's voice in over the din of the sound systems. Prota is warning anyone suspected of using the hack that they could find their food and power supplies cut off. Riz listened too, looking back at the party. She shook her head with a laugh. Up ahead of them, a DJ in a green ski mask spun floating flickering discs in the air in front of a wall of bass bins at a party being thrown by Metaverse radio station Culture Cult. Mr. Dallas was there too, spitting into the mic. The air rippled and snarled as luminous waves of 3D bass music billowed through the crowd. A sadness washed over Jaden with the music. Mr. Dallas was Carlos' favorite MC. Without warning, a team of marshals burst from a side street, fanning out like ants. The crowd scattered. People began pelting the robots with food and trash. The marshals clapped back with heat. Jaden felt terror rising in their chest as the screaming started. The robots barged into the sound system, kicking in the bass bins, hauling away the DJ and Dallas as the party became a riot. Jaden bellowed a familiar voice. Jaden turned to see a hulking, pixelated shadow, also in a D-tag hoodie and broadside chest armor, crouched in an alleyway, beckoning. Jaden and Riz looked at each other and at the robot circling and ran towards the gap in the buildings. Jaden grabbed Riz and they haired down the maze of alleyways, following the hooded figure, until the sounds of the riot were muffled by the labyrinth of narrow, crooked, 3D printed buildings around them. The figure stopped. Riz and Jaden slowed up too, catching their breath. Thank you, said Jaden. All part of the service, the figure said, removing the hood. The pixels dissolved back into reality, revealing Shiv's grinning face. That was too close, said Riz. We should have taken the back way. 
Jaden noticed that Riz was still holding their hand. Riz noticed too, looking up at Jaden with a nervous smile, before gently letting go. She'd said that too, but I was hungry, said another familiar voice that sounded like it was chewing food. Jaden turned to see Taki up ahead in the shadows, also in a D-tag hoodie and broadside bone suit, with a burrito in one hand and a digital spray can in the other, which he was using to deface a proto-billboard floating above the alley. Instead of the familiar line, power, security, freedom, Taki had altered it to read, purgatory, slavery, fascism. Bitch please, you always hungry, Shiv said, chiding their friend. Jaden smiled. The riot behind them sounded far away. They looked around the alley. On a wall close by, an old-fashioned spray paint, someone has scrawled, resistance is fertile. Above, skull and crossbones emojis were floating around in the sky, like little stars. Another digital message demanded, sign Accra now. Jaden motioned to the graffiti. This is out of control. Riz nodded, looking around. The hacks got people thinking. Seeing how life can be different. Zero was right. Shiv hiked an eyebrow at this. I don't know. They said. Making everything free sounds like straight up chaos to me. Which I'm totally fine with by the way. Shiv grinned and cracked their knuckles, motioning for the others to follow them. The four of them began walking in the opposite direction from the riot. Jaden respected Shiv's anarchic perspective, but suddenly felt compelled to communicate what Zero had said. I don't think he means everything should be free, Jaden said. Just some things. The basics. Right. Taki sniffed, flicking his shiny hair. A bifurcated market. Well, if it's bi, I know you into it, said Shiv. Taki smirked and gave Shiv the dig in the arm. Shiv laughed, shoving him back playfully. Taki pointed to a scratched-up sticker of a cartoon figure wearing a black hoodie and pink glasses stuck to the chest plate of Shiv's armor. Jaden's talking about stuff that's CC0, no copyright, public domain. Like this sticker you got. This is Right Click and Save Us Guy by X Copy. Right? And what? Said Shiv, nodding. How much you pay for it? Taki asked. Nothing, I just printed it said Shiv. Right, because it's CC0. Taki nodded, taking another bite of the burrito. But the original NFT of Right Click and Save Us Guy is hanging in the Louvre and worth like a bajillion dollars. It's worth money because everybody knows it. Because everyone can share it. The more people share free copies, the more the original is worth. Shiv took this in. Okay word, but what about your armor? Replied Shiv. What about it? Answered Taki, still talking with his mouth full. Shiv motioned to Taki's chest plate. Its brand new candied paint job gleamed like a fresh manicure, not a CC0 sticker or scratch in sight. I know you hiked this one, but the design you're wearing is the official AXO V1 bone suit. I also know you got this original, unhacked bone suit in like six other colors, and you paid a lot for those. AXO the Broadside League and Proto make a lot of money from selling these to kids like you because AXO and Proto own the full commercial rights to it. Shiv poked at Taki's armor, shoving him sideways, laughing. Taki stumbled, laughing too, hitting the side of a printer recycle bin filled with plastics, knocking several items into the alley in front of them. You can do both. It's like bottled water said Jaden, motioning to a plastic bottle as it rolled to a stop just ahead. Shiv, Taki, and Riz all looked at Jaden, puzzled. You can have it either way, and it still works. CC0, or commercial rights. Anyone can get free water out the faucet, right? Jaden continued. But we also have name brand bottled water, and people buy lots of it. People pay for premium water, even though you can get free water whenever and wherever you want. Jaden was surprised to hear themselves explaining Zero's point of view like this. They hadn't realized they had thought about it this deeply, much less agreed with it, or at least, cared enough to articulate it to someone else. Okay. Got it. Shiv nodded. So, with the Acra Protocol stuff, it's like they asking for government cheese. We'll have government cheese solar energy, government cheese versions of lots of stuff. 
but then you'll also be able to buy like mac and cheese level solar energy, gruyere level solar, etc. Sort of, said Taki, finishing the burrito. Except the government wouldn't centrally control all this stuff, like they do with government cheese. All they gotta do is ratify Accra. It's about giving us access to basic reusable printer materials, a set of CC0 designs for basic goods that are free to use, and then getting out of everyone's way. Jaden hadn't seen this more intellectual side of Taki before. Shiv seemed like they understood. They looked at Jaden. Well, whatever happens, this was all you, Jaden. Shiv said. I mean, you straight up mushroom stamp proto with this hack. You should be mad proud of that. Jaden stifled a smile. The grief was ever present, but Shiv's comment made their hearts swell with pride, a feeling Jaden instantly felt guilty about. This had cost Carlos his life. Taki steadied Jaden, flicking the burrito wrapper into a trash can and pulling his long hair back into a ponytail. You do see that, right? He said. What you did will change things. Jaden took this in as the group walked on, out of the alley, and onto a busy street, pulling their hoods up as they emerged. The one good thing to come from this was Jaden had done something they thought was impossible. Changed things. More than that, people Jaden looked up to, some of the best broadside players in the league, knew it was Jaden that did it. Or at least, they knew Warhead had done it. Even if no one knew exactly who Warhead was outside of their immediate circle. It felt good to have Shiv and Taki treating them as a peer. It felt good to call them friends. But it also felt awful, given how Jaden got to this point. Jaden felt their emotions come into focus as the conflicting feelings of gratitude and grief swirled together into a cloud of anger. Maybe. But I'm here for Carlos. I'm doing this for him. The others nodded, silently respecting this. The group ducked through a doorway, down a flight of stairs opening into a basement-level parking garage at the back of the dead mall. They approached a crowd gathered on one side of the garage. Jason spotted them and nodded. They walked over to him. Jaden noticed a lot of people wearing D-tag hoodies, broadside face grills, and many others in bone suits. It was not unusual to see broadsiders wearing pieces of gear off the field. But since the raids, people who didn't play had been doing it too, as a show of solidarity. Jaden recognized broadsiders from all over the bay, but kept their hood up, not wanting any attention right now. Jaden was tired of people telling them how sorry they were about Carlos, like they could do something about it. There were others in the garage who were clearly not broadsiders. Some were Zero's age and wore the hand and eye t-shirt, the mark of the invisible hand. Jaden looked around at the crowd. A Hispanic woman in her 50s stood next to a young black woman dressed like a construction worker with her arm in a sling. Next to her was another kid who looked like he was related to the construction worker but was wearing a broadside grill and chest plate. It felt like the whole city was here. A fold-up table stood in the middle of the crowd. A modified 3D1 sat on top of it, surrounded by bits of equipment. A stack of speakers was behind it, much like the stack behind the DJ at the street party. Next to the table was a lifeless, offline marshal hanging like a puppet from a chain bolted to the ceiling. The crowd simmered as a figure in a hoodie stepped out, face down, dread swaying. Zero removed the hood and looked around at his audience. Jaden looked at him. Something had changed. He was standing straighter. He was clean-shaven and in a clean shirt. He looked reinvigorated, younger almost. He cleared his throat. New technologies cause revolutions. Zero began. The printing press took down religion. The internet killed the printing press. But what came next? The combination of blockchain, cheap solar, in vitro and reusable 3D printed materials, all metaverse connected? That changed everything. He hit a button on the 3D one. It whirred as it woke up, starting to print something. Or at least, it did everywhere else. Zero continued. Prota denied America its revolution with the massacre in 29. But the broadside hack means revolution is finally at hand. Which is why they started killing us again. 
They are scared. They know we don't have to depend on them anymore. They know we can fight back. A murmur rippled through the crowd. Zero turned and opened a map of downtown San Francisco in the air. He zoomed in on the checkpoint at the top of Market Street. We're going to hit Proto back where it hurts, he said. Show Corp is no longer in control. But this isn't a game. We need real weapons. Real equipment. All the things we couldn't print before. The first thing you need, if you don't have one already, is one of these. He pulled his hood up. His face became a blur of pixels. This is a D-tag hoodie. Print one out. Wear it at all times. Just don't get caught. These things are very illegal. It will block all data, both in and out, while the hood is up. No one will be able to scan you. It'll keep the drones off your scent too. He took off the hoodie, and his face reappeared as he walked over to the speaker stack. LRADs are sonic weapons. Feds have been using them for years to disperse human crowds with high-pitched sounds. But we discovered that low-end frequencies mess with the robots. So. We retrofitted speakers with LRAD tech designed to jam up a Marshall's operating system. Zero opened a music app and selected a track. He looked past it and smirked at Jaden. What do you kids call it now? 3D bass? That stuff works great. He stopped smiling. If you're not wearing a helmet, please cover your ears now. Zero threw on a 3D bass track. A vortex of bass rippled outwards from the speaker, shaking rib cages. Jaden felt every hair on their head vibrating, even through their helmets' ear protectors. The crowd covered their ears or threw their helmets on. The marshal's eyes flickered erratically as it shuddered and swayed, bumping against the visible pulse of 3D bass. Zero lowered the volume, but left the music on in the background as he picked up a broadside gauntlet from a combat-grade bone suit lying on the table. Jaden noticed it was thicker than the modded stuff they had made. It had the same colorway as their armor files they'd shared with Zero, only now the bright colors were dark and murky like someone had mixed in black paint. There were spikes on the animal skull helmet now. Short spikes on the knuckles, shoulders, and elbows of the armor too. The gauntlets tightened around Zero's arm with a low squeal. He walked over to the marshal. These new bone suits are thicker, Zero said over the music. Not quite military grade, but they'll take a few heat blasts. I also took the liberty of adding spikes to the knuckles, helmet, and elbows. Why, you ask? In one movement, he twisted his leg, hip, and shoulder behind the weight of his fist. He threw a left hook into the body of the robot with power and precision, puncturing its ribcage. Green liquid gushed from the wound, spattering the floor. The room made a sound like it was surprised. Marshals run on hydraulics, fluids, he explained. Hit them between the armor plates. Sever a main line, and you'll take one down. He turned around, with his back to the crowd. Jaden's heart filled for the second time that evening when they saw Zero had kept two words stenciled on the back of his armor design. Skeleton crew. He picked up what looked like a handgun from the table. He turned to the crowd and sighed, thinking, choosing his words carefully. I know a lot of you are angry. A lot of you want blood, he said. Jaden felt like he was looking straight at them. Too many of my friends have been killed by Prota by their so-called non-lethal weapons. Well, we won't be using them. ADS rays can kill. We will win this without damaging any living thing. We will not hurt anyone. We are freedom fighters, not terrorists. The crowd exchanged glances and a few disapproving boos, confused by the pacifist holding the gun. We will not fire a single bullet, he proclaimed, aiming the handgun at the marshal. He pulled the trigger. A kernel of blue light exploded from the gun and slammed into the marshal's head. Green goo erupted from its temple. The dead robot swayed with the impact. The booing turned to cheering. Instead, we will use these, he said, holding up the smoking gun. EMP blasters. 
they fire an electromagnetic pulse at an impact pressure high enough to puncture the hydraulics, but not enough to break bones. Zero paced as he spoke, looking as many people in the eyes as he could. Do not fire these at other people. They won't kill, but they will hurt. He returned to the table, picking up a shotgun. This works on the same principle, but is better at close range. He said as he walked back to the marshal, flicking his dreadlocks out of his face. The EMP shotgun fired a thick burst of blue light. It ripped a hole in the robot's lifeless torso. Green goo flecked the crowd, who moved back, shouting, shocked and excited by the blast. Zero turned to look at the 3D1, which had completed its job. It spat out a blue and silver orb. He leaned over and picked it up. Finally, we have good old EMP grenades. These can brick the operating system of an entire martial squadron, if you time it just right. He squeezed the grenade. It charged up. He hurled it, and... A ball of blue light sent the marshal flying, a handful of broadside players too. The music cut out as the speaker stack shorted out and toppled over. The players got up, dazed, but unharmed. Sparks danced as the dead robot's jittering body convulsed. People cheered. The room was a buzz. Print what you need. Zero shouted over the hum of the crowd. Jaden felt a sense of excitement make its way over the sadness. They wished Carlos was there. It was because of Jaden that the city was armed and ready to fight back. It was because of them that Zero and his organization finally felt they could change things. Carlos would be proud. It was because of the hack and because of the rage and sadness Jaden felt that for the first time in their life, they could be about to do something important. Taking down Proto wouldn't just mean getting revenge. It would also be a way to honor Carlos. To change people's lives. To give Carlos a legacy. To make all the sadness mean something. Replace your old broadside gear with the new combat grade bone suits. Zero continued. They will protect you from both ADS rays and EMP blasts. Two figures with bandaged heads began handing out NFT tags with the invisible hand logo to people in the crowd. All the weapons and armor design files are available on IPFS via the tags we are handing out. Zero continued. Use the hack. Start distributing this stuff to those who want to join us. Start stockpiling. He turned and then turned back, remembering something. Oh, and please don't use any existing wallets or currencies in connection with any of this. Set up a clean wallet. We've included a new form of currency they can't track known as bones on the tags. If you need to trade with each other for any reason, please do everything using bones. Jaden took a tag from a bandaged figure and opened the bones wallet. A gold coin with a skull and crossbones logo appeared, spinning slowly, eyes glowing in the air. Be ready. Zero continued. Get your people ready. We will be in touch. Whether you played broadside since you could walk, or never played at all, this is no longer a game. Zero took a breath, looking left to right, wielding the silence like a club. We are all broadsiders now. He bellowed. The crowd roared. Jaden roared with them. The broadsiders filed out of the underground garage into the night. Members of the Invisible Hand stood at the door, handing out NFT tags with bones and design files on them. Jaden and their friends were last out. Zero walked in front of Jaden, talking to Jason. It's no problem. I can handle it. Jason said to Zero. Handle what? Jaden interjected, catching up with them. Zero slowed his pace to walk with Jaden. Jason raised an eyebrow at Jaden and walked on ahead. Jason setting up a comm center for us. Zero explained. There are hundreds in on this now. We need a secure way to talk. Jason looked back, smiling like the cat that got the cream. Jaden felt irritated. Why was Jason setting up the comm center? Jaden was the mastermind behind the hack, after all. They caught themselves. Jaden knew the grief was bringing out all the worst parts of their character. They read an article on grief saying this would happen. Fear of being left out or passed over was real for Jaden. It had been their entire life. They took a breath, trying to let this go. 
Zero narrowed his eyes at Jaden, smiling, understanding something. Don't worry. I have another job for you.